So you're practicing Sinfonia number 15 in B minor by Bach, and it's giving you a hard time. The repeated notes are sounding like you're driving on a gravel road. And the sextuplets are sounding like you're falling down the stairs. And if we're going to fix those, we need to get in there and get our toolbox out, find the right bit on our screwdriver so we can tighten up all those loose ends and send this little musical rocket ship out into space. Well, hi there again. Welcome back to my channel. And as I say, we're looking at Sinfonia number 15 in B minor. Now, Erwin Bodke said that uh, B minor was Bach's favorite key. I mean, this is the key that he wrote the B minor mass in and uh, the overture in the French style. Uh, so uh, it's also his initial, right? B, <laughs> Mr. B. So uh, take that into consideration. And the first thing I have to say before we get into the trenches and do our spade work, as Theodore Leschetizky would say, and that is, you notice, I have a watch on. Take your watch off. <laughs> I never play with any watches on anymore. That, ha that stopped ages ago. But it occurred to me that some of you perhaps play with stuff on. <laughs> Take the stuff off. <laughs> so if you've got a watch on, especially one of those big, clunky, chunky watches, they must weigh, I don't know, like, <laughs> a pound <laughs> they're pretty they're pretty big take it off take it off uh, as well any bracelets that you may be wearing and rings you got a pinky ring <laughs> i hate pinky rings <laughs> take it off Ta but do remove as much stuff from your wrists hands and fingers as possible because that all contributes to good piano technique <laughs> uh, so let's get in there with this piece um those repeated notes, right? There's lots of them. St the first one we have are all those F sharps. What we want to listen for is not the repeated notes, but the non-repeated notes. And you notice that those repeated notes are on the weak part of the bar. The, f the notes that are on the front of those groups of three, those are the ones you lis want to listen for. And I think overall with this piece, it's very useful to maintain a clear sense of the triple meter. This piece is in 916. That's the meter. It means we have nine sixteenth notes in every bar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So three beats, each made up of three. <laughs> and on the fronts of each of those three, you want to feel your little pulse. And that can get totally lost and ambiguous, lost in the gray area. <laughs> I love gray. <laughs> but in this case, we don't want to lose our pulse in the gray area. We want to keep it clear. And, and that will uh, uh, safeguard against these uh, repeated notes sticking out and causing thorns in our side. <laughs> so uh, you can practice um, accenting the first of each group of three notes and try to aim for lightness of touch on the repeated notes. If you think of the, uh, the key and, and how deep it goes down, the notes that you want to hear the least, the notes, in other words, that are perhaps less important, less maybe structurally important, i.e. these repeated notes, try to play them lighter in the key. In other words, not going all the way down as far as the key goes. And on the notes that are on the, on the front of the beat, or particularly your down beats, the strong beats, uh, the ones that are not repeated, <laughs> these are the more essential notes to listen for, and therefore can you can afford to go deeper into the key, push the key more to the bottom. And a good way to practice that is to uh, accent uh, each beat. And uh, so let's do a little bit of that. It's not the most pretty thing to listen to, 
uh, but it does help with kind of corralling the beats into place, you know. The, the last thing we want is for the, the pulse to go astray, you know. You know, there's a, the fence is broken and one of the cows got loose and oh no, you know. <laughs> we want the fence uh, of our meter and pulse uh, nicely hammered into the ground, right? So let me practice a little bit for you at a slow tempo. Although ultimately this one, I, I think, <laughs> will and probably should go like the wind. That's why I like to call it a little musical rocket ship. Uh, but let's uh, go slowly with an accent on each of the three beats of every bar. Uh, those are the notes we're going to go deeper into the key. And on those other notes, the repeated notes, we're going to be lighter. Okay? I'm also... Uh, well, you won't hear this so much because the microphone is not like right next to my mouth when I'm playing. I'll try to do it loudly though, and that is counting out loud. I haven't talked at all <laughs> in any of my videos about counting out loud, but my goodness, it comes up all the time when I'm teaching and when I'm practicing myself. I do a lot of counting out loud. My teacher, from the time I started lessons when I was seven years old, she had me do a ton of counting. One and two and three, you know, of course you use your metronome as well, but mostly it's the counting out loud. You being your own metronome, that's what's useful. So this helps with regularity of pulse and metric clarity, as well as lightening up those repeated notes. <laughs> so let me do a little of this spade work. We'll get in the trench here, get out our shovel, and do some technical technical work here. Counting out loud. <laughs> I'll go nice and slowly. One, two, three, two, two, three, three. Here we go. This kind of thing at a slow tempo. Do that a few times when you're practicing and then alternate that because let's face it, that method of practice is not helping at all with tone color or listening for important notes. Well, maybe a hint it's helping for that. Um, character of the piece, spirit, you know, tone, dynamics, this kind of thing. Uh, no. This exercise is helping with pulse and with articulation, right? And that's part of the thing. When you're working on a piece, you, you want to, <laughs> uh, you know, I had a teacher at Eastman who used to say that every lesson is a monitored practice session. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, hey, <laughs> There's, that's good advice. <laughs> and uh, that was from a pedagogy class that we had. And it's true, when you're giving a lesson, the idea is to try to uh, help that player learn to listen. Why? So that they can become their own teacher. And, and because once you hear the things that are going wrong, and you've got tools in your toolbox. <laughs> I got my multi-purpose screwdriver here, you know. Um, <laughs> once you can hear what's going on, there's a lump there. Oh, my pulse is, is not clear. Uh, I'm rushing or my tone is harsh, you know. And then that's the first step. And then the second step is, okay, how do I fix problem A, B, C? Which tool in my toolbox, which of these bits <laughs> is, uh, do I need to insert into the screwdriver to tighten up those loose bolts in my playing, right? And this, this particular bolt, you know, this particular practice uh, exercise that I just did is not going to tighten every bolt. It's only going to tighten that particular problem of uh, metric ambiguity and heaviness on the repeated notes. But to fix other issues that you may have, you first need to be able to identify them and then know which tool in the toolbox. And Acquiring the tools for the, for the toolbox, that is 
our life's work. <laughs> I have more tools in my piano practice toolbox now than I had five years ago and way more than I had <laughs> 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, I can't imagine how many more tools I'll have, you know, 10 years from now. That's exciting to think. Knock on wood, and this is wood. <laughs> you can't knock on wood on an electric piano, that's for sure. Um, but you just got to listen and know how to practice. So that's how I would go about practice. I'm not going to do the play the whole piece for you in that fashion, accenting each beat, counting out loud, but you get the sense. This is essential. <laughs> Besides the repeated notes, there's another technical uh, ointment or ailment. <laughs> ailment, there we go, <laughs> that we need some medication for, right? And uh, what are we going to take to get rid of the lumpiness and clunkiness that I think all of us probably face when we come to the sextuplets in this piece? Nine times out of ten, it sounds like falling down the stairs. <laughs> you know, like you're dropping something down the stairs and it's clunk, 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 clunk this kind of thing. These, these passages, the sextuplets. <laughs> where it's not clear and even. Now, granted the, uh, and I should say, <laughs> I get excited, sorry. <laughs> uh, what, we, what do we want it to sound like? We want it to sound like a gesture, not like a bunch of angles and rocks and lumps kinds of thing, but one rounded gesture. I have my ring light behind the camera here and I see this like big circle and and that's a wonderful analogy in my playing if you've watched some of my performances I, t I do tend to move a fair bit not when I'm playing musical theater stuff <laughs> but when I'm playing Bach I move a lot and a lot of the time that movement is my left hand kind of doing some circular gestures because I'm it's, I can't help it. It's an involuntary reaction, but it's based on a desire to j almost like mold with my hands the sound in air in rounded shapes. Um, and we don't want, I think anyway, we don't want to have clunky angular bits. Sometimes that's nice, but not in this. It, imp it impairs our rocket ship from getting off the ground. So, uh, listening for um, rounded gestures so that we get a little bit more of this kind of sound. You'll notice I'm coming from above the key. When I initiate the sextuplet, the first one, there's three of them in a row. This is measure three. I'm coming from above with a very clear attack, like, like you're a... Uh, a swimmer and you're, you're diving, you're diving off the, the diving board, boom, you know, I, which I don't do. I'm terrified of, <laughs> of t water and pools and <laughs> not terrified, but of diving. That scares me. Um, but it seems like they're so precise when they jump off the diving board. There's like a particular spot on the board and they have to come from, from above, you know, um, think of the key. The key is like a, di a diving board, right? <laughs> and your little finger is the diver, Pew, right? <laughs> You'll get a much clearer uh, point of attack that will then sustain you through the whole circular gesture. So coming from above, my teacher, Constance Keen at Manhattan School of Music, I talk about her all the time. She was a dear, um, the most... I think certainly the most influential teacher and musical person that I've ever had and one of my greatest friends. I miss her dearly. And she always talked about coming from above. You must approach the key from above when you're initiating uh, maybe a, a new kind of a musical texture or a new passage, you know, passage work. Uh, this, these sextuplets in measure three uh, we haven't had those yet in the texture. It's been all the repeated notes. So that's something new. And when something new comes into the piece, into the, into the music, it's like, you know, 
It's like get a sticky note out. You know, you want your listener to be aware of these things. And so coming from above is good for that. It's also good for relaxing the arm because if you play the entire piece that you're working on from, from on the key, no matter how much arm and back and rotation and movement and all of this that you're doing, it's not going to help if you're not also coming off the key. Because when you come off the key, hopefully, <laughs> your, your hand is uh, returning, if only for a nanosecond, to a natural rounded hand position. And that gives everything up here, your muscles and everything, a chance to relax. And then you, you get into position as soon as you approach the key. So let me approach uh, some of these sextuplets for you slowly. Uh, I'm going to feel my pulse before I start. And I'm going to come from above. Remember, we're aiming for circular gestures. <coughs> 916, <coughs> the, the meter of this piece, is a kind of compound meter. And to, uh, to me, anyway, compound meters, 6-8 uh, is another one, 9-8, they just naturally have more of a rounded character to them as opposed to something in simple time like 4-4 four, four, or 3-4 or 2-4, uh, you know, 1-2-3-4, 1-2-and-2-and-3-and-4. Uh, you know, and and where each beat is made up of two little subdivisions. But in these compound meters, as we saw earlier, each beat is made up of three little subdivisions and to me three just sort of rounds things out so that's where I'm going with this circular gesture it also helps to give <laughs> like <s> pep <laughs> to the piece uh, to think of these gestures in a circular fashion so here I go starting with measure three So that initial point of contact on the downbeat is like my diver making contact with the diving board. And then the rest of that bar, the rest of those six tuplets, is like the hang time, the air time, <laughs> you know. And then the next downbeat in the next bar is, is sort of like your, your, uh, your next level, your next gate post, your next point on, in the fence along the way kind of thing your next push-off point, your next <laughs> diving board push-off point, that kind of thing. Uh, there's another group of sextuplets, um, measure six. This one, this time it happens with both hands. Both hands are doing the sextuplets. One, two, three. <laughs> Now, granted, fingering can be a real issue, I know. Um, but, <laughs> well, you can check out some of my other videos in which I've talked about fingering. Fingering is a very personal thing, and I, do never, I never want to recommend that you use my fingering or anyone else's fingerings. I mean, steel. <laughs> if there's something that works, by all means, use it. But you need to craft your own fingerings and preparing for what's to come, uh, avoiding use of the thumb as much as possible. There are some general tips that I've talked about before, um, but all in conjunction with this coming from above, feeling a clear meter that each bar you're making a circular gesture. Now, I don't know how much you could see this, but I was trying to move my entire body almost like in time, as it were, with the meter. And you could do this even with your lid down. So this is like, and this is sometimes how I practice um, when there's a lot of notes that are hard to fit into a meter. And I want that rounded, no corners, you know, totally <laughs> smooth and uh, circular gestures, is to try to get my whole body riding the meter. 
So I could practice something like this. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. Now my fingers are, are not moving in, they're not playing, playing <laughs> the notes. It's, they're moving a little bit. Really, they're doing what they want. But this is, this exercise I use more for the rest of the body, the bigger <laughs> limbs and so forth, not just the little fingers. Um, so that your body knows where the downbeats are. One, two, three. One, two, you know, and you can do that as you're, as you're sitting on the bus. <laughs> maybe, maybe someone will laugh at you, but who cares, right? They should be so lucky to have this piece in their life <laughs> and to play the piano. <laughs> um, or as you're, you know, sitting, reading a book, put the book down for a moment and just feel the meter in your body and go to the downbeats. That is absolutely essential. And so a mix of those methods of practice will hopefully get the screws <laughs> tightened up, tighten up those bolts on your musical uh, table, as it were. <laughs> uh, now, we need to talk a little bit about listening, what notes to listen for. And I think this is where Bach's music gets particularly, you know, <laughs> brilliant and, and uh, just infectiously contagious with its wonder because there's, uh, there's, there's all these voices. Uh, in this piece, we have three voices. That's the case with all of his 15 sinfonias. Uh, so a, a, a top, a middle, and a bottom voice shared between the hands. And, uh, you know, this is intermediate music. This is, well, yeah, intermediate, perhaps uh, slightly advanced uh, music. Um, this is not like the preludes and fugues, um, but this is difficult music, and uh, he uses uh, a lot of repetition of little patterns and sequences and things like this, and combined with these circular gestures created by these groups of sextuplets, the, the compound meter, uh, it, it really, that's where I get the, the image in my mind of a musical rocket ship. I think that's what this piece uh, conjures up in my mind. And I want that rocket ship, not like the one we had, you know, <laughs> that had to take several cracks at it a few months ago. <laughs> we want it to <laughs> soar right up to the moon or wherever it's going on the first try. And so it's not just the technical side of things, which we've been looking at so far, um, and the physical side of things, but also the ear and listening. So, you know, m when I'm playing this music, I, Bach in general, I try to have pretty well in every moment of every piece a note or perhaps two <laughs> that I'm listening for a little bit more than others. And that goes beyond what we did at the very beginning where we said in these uh, repeated note figures that we wanted to hear the repeated notes less and the, the non-repeated notes more. Well, this is like going, uh, zooming your, your lens out. Um, yeah, I think it was Glenn Gould who used to talk sort of uh, with microphones and, and recorded sound as... A as if it were like camera work in a film, you know, um, that the ear could get right up close, like a close-up shot in a movie, and then it would pan out, and the ear would hear a different, a different like spectrum of sound, um, like acoustical kind of experimentation, and um, so I feel like uh, now <laughs> what I'm going to tell you is like the panning out, getting the wide shot kind of thing. Um, looking at the whole forest, not every individual tree. tree. Um, so I have on a piece of paper here, and I'll, I'll share it on the screen, some just basic essential notes that I'm listening for. It, uh, I'm not a theory teacher. I'm not, I don't teach counterpoint. 
I've had, you know, <laughs> a lot of piano training and, and much, much less <laughs> theory and counterpoint. Um, but I got a little bit, and it's it's mostly my pianist instincts, and just trying to trying to find something that sounds pretty <laughs> and that's that that's convincing to me. And usually it's movement by step. Movement by step is the most singable, certainly. And I feel like if we can extract movement by step and s listen to these uh, notes as we're playing all of the notes it can create some three, 3D kinds of texture and, and shape to the music. Um, Let me play you my, my notes. I've extracted, I'll, I'll show you here on the screen. For the most part, I have one note per bar, per hand. And there's a couple spots where uh, each hand has two notes. So I've really narrowed it down. <laughs> I've, I've extracted just a few notes from many, many notes. And this is mostly movement by step. There's some sequences marked in. And uh, so let me just play this for you. And as you're, if, you, if you do this kind of thing on your own, where you sort of pick out notes uh, that you want to hear, and you play them by themselves many times, and then you go back and add the rest of the notes, still listening for those essential notes, um, that can do wonders for your playing. And when you're doing it, you have to also be still listening for the music, listening to the piece, even though you're just playing like the skeleton of it. <laughs> um, so when I'm playing this little reduction, I'm still hearing all of the notes in my mind. Why don't we take this in chunks? So I'll do the first... Uh, I'll do the first six bars. I'll play the piece as it is. There's the first six bars. Play it slowly. Now, let me play you my little reduction first six bars, but still hear what you just heard. Still hear the piece. So it's, it's, it's not terribly exciting, right? <laughs> but it's movement largely by step, and uh, I it's, it's, it's something to latch on to. And for the most part, for the most part, it's the first note of the bar. We're just looking for triads, you know, harmonic movement, uh, where the chord changes. Uh, in a way, the same kind of technique is when you're deciding when to pedal, you know, when a harmony changes, you change your pedal, otherwise you get blurry, unwanted sound. Um, kind of the same thing and there's no right or wrong to this I can assure you and uh, it's just finding what makes sense and and doing that because at the end of the day what our goal is at the piano is not just to communicate through the music to ourselves but to communicate to others and that's very hard to do and it requires exaggeration you got to get your ideas past the footlights. I had a teacher at the Eastman School of Music, one of the voice faculty. I used to play for lots of singers, and I would go to their voice lessons, and uh, it was very interesting <laughs> in learning how to breathe and diction and vowels and poetry and uh, uh, costume to a certain extent, <laughs> and um, singing in different languages, operas and art songs and all this kind of thing, and having to look at the audience as you perform. <laughs> we don't have to do that as a pianist. But one of the things that was interesting the teacher said was about, um, she said to the singer, you must, you have to project your ideas beyond the stage. Now, I'm not on a stage here. I'm in my kitchen. This is my dining room, believe it or not. <laughs> I've got my dining table there and uh, the door and the the wall, that, that's it. It's a very tiny space. But you you have to imagine that your room is like a, 
wherever you're playing your piano, that it's a, you're conjuring up magic. And, and even if there's no one there immediately next to you that you're playing for, imagine that there is. Imagine that you're playing for someone, even if it's the ghost, <laughs> right? And how do you get your ideas to be felt by other people? It's the same thing with communicating ourselves or people who write books and stories. You know, they feel it in their inside, but how do you get it out there so that other people feel what you feel? That's extremely difficult to do. So getting your ideas past the footlights so that other people can feel them. And this voice teacher, <laughs> circling back here, <laughs> said to the student to imagine that there's a wall of tissue paper in front of you. And, and the way you're playing now is it's, it's stopping when it hits the tissue paper. You want to over, you want to, ex I don't want to say overdo, you want to exaggerate. You need to ramp up everything you're doing to a bigger scale so that you can <coughs> push through the tissue paper and get your ideas and your thoughts about the music, your feelings, everything you want to say at your piano out there to the world or maybe you're making videos yourself maybe you're not performing in a in Carnegie Hall or at the local church but you're making videos perhaps and people are watching you it's a stage it's a different kind of a stage but it's a stage and you want to get your ideas felt by the listener and that is so hard that is artistry and it takes a lifetime to just begin to understand um and so exaggeration, <laughs> that's what we're doing. And when you do slow practice, like we did with those sextuplets coming from above and the repeated notes, and now this kind of may seem kind of boring and mundane to just play. <laughs> like, what does that have to do with three voices of polyphony? Oh, but... The purpose of all of this is so that we can exaggerate our ideas and get them out there past the footlights. So, uh, and this gives the ear something to latch on to so that when we are playing everything on the page, we're still hearing these notes. This, this is basically what I'm hearing. You will hear different notes, uh, I hopefully, <laughs> when you're playing because um, you want to give shape. Uh, so let's carry on then. That was the first six bars. Um, then at measure seven, we have a little sequence. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. There's a sequence. Let me play that as written. Again, slowly. One, two, three. One. the passage. Now let me play my little extracted essential notes from that sequence. Measure 7 to 11. Still hearing the pulse. Right? It's like putting the seed in the ear and 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 giving it good soil and some fertilizer and uh, watering it and then packing the soil in and then watering it some more and building a little you know soil cushion so that it's not like <laughs> toppling over the poor thing and the roots are coming out only four weeks later you know getting these notes nestled in your ear this is essential i think to playing box music <laughs> Uh, every time I say box music, I think of what YouTube does when it auto-generates the, <laughs> the subtitles for my videos, and it puts B-O-X, box yeah. music. <laughs> um, carrying on, in measure 11 and 12, uh, we got another sequence, so let me play that as written. And even in between plays, 
of these little passages, I like to still keep my body moving. You see, I'm not playing, but I'm st it's still playing in my head. <laughs> I'm still moving with the pulse. Right? So now let me play my little extracted notes, essential notes. <laughs> Measure 11. Let me keep going with that. I think we got the sense of it in our ear. Um, so this is measure 14. Now here we got another sequence. I'm going to play this because the sequences are important, I think. There's a number of them in this piece, and uh, they're very, th they're always so pleasing to the ear, right? Who, who doesn't love a good musical sequence? Um, it's just a little pattern, something that gets repeated, repeated, either down a step or up a step. Um, and we've had two already. <laughs> this is the third one. This is at measure 20. Let me play it as written. Two, three. Even when I'm not playing, I'm feeling that compound meter. I'm feeling those little pulsations. Yum, bum, 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 bum. Strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak, strong. With the overall downbeats being the strongest and always circular. The whole bar is circular and even each of those little beats, those little groups of three, those are circular. They're just little circles maybe. <laughs> we got little circles three per bar, and then each bar is a one big circle, right? And it's all rolling and moving and pulsating like gears of a watch, you know, a nicely made Swiss clock or something, and everything lines up perfectly. It's very satisfying to think of those images, I think. <laughs> um, or an engine, if you like cars. I do like cars, too, you, as you know. Um, so uh, that was... Measure 20, I'm going to play my, I've got an itchy nose, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I'm going to play my extracted notes now. Uh, one, two, measure 20. And then carrying on, with my little extracted notes at 26. over but it's still it's still happening in my mind <laughs> right and so if you can combine this listening of essential notes with circular gestures coming from above the key when you go to initiate a new sextuplet and lightening your repeated notes in the in the little triplets you'll be well on your way to success and then of course you want to pick the tempo up because <laughs> That's a little, a little slow, I think, but much slow practice is needed. And this piece, I think probably the, the well, the end is certainly <laughs> the destination, <laughs> let's face it, but perhaps the high point of the piece that it's building up towards is that lovely fermata um, on the F sharp chord in measure 32. I think it's it's building up to there. It's like pent up energy, even from the beginning. The pot is bubbling. The water, you know, is not like blowing the lid off the pot, but it's 
it's also not just like lukewarm. It's it's pretty darn hot. It's close to boiling. <laughs> It's like urgent. Uh, uh, there's something going on, and you need to kind of and and like like a spinning top. Someone in a comment on a video recently used that analogy, and I love it. <laughs> you know, spinning top. Um, you want to keep that spin going until until this high point for sure at uh, 32, um, which is this spot. Uh, I start at 30. <laughs> gosh <laughs> he sits on that fermata that chord for a whole bar a whole bar he sits plus a fermata so it's like longer than a whole bar and then in, and then that tied note f sharp and then it's like but the spinning is not done yet right and uh it's just, it's just like like those gymnasts with the with the flags you know I don't know what it's called. Um, and they, they twirl the flags and they create all these beautiful colors and spinning rainbow figures and things. Um, that's what this, to me, sounds like. And then the left hand gets it. And I need to practice this before I perform it. <laughs> and that left hand note, <coughs> I'm getting excited, <laughs> is going to the E sharp. Oh, that is a shock. That is a total shock. This is measure 34. If you have some trouble um, articulating these, uh, these six tuplets as the notes get further apart, even, with, even despite you know, coming off the key um, and rotating and feeling circles, <laughs> uh, break them up into smaller chunks. This is a good spot. This one at tw uh, 34 uh, in the left hand is hard. It's hard. This is where we get a lot of it sounding like it's falling down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so break it up into little chunks. Always feeling, feeling the meter. <laughs> just the first sex tuplet or even just the back end of it or the front end of it and then do it for this the next sex tuplet you'll need depending on the size of your hand because we're all different we come in different shapes and sizes you'll need to rotate a little bit to help the fingers. I mean, no matter how hard the fingers are working and how strong and energized they are and everything else, um, unless you're c helping and cooperating with your wrist, just some lateral rotation for transportation purposes. <laughs> if you just try to do it without the rotating, that's where we get falling down the stair syndrome. <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> Pave the road and get good fuel in the tank uh, or charge the battery <laughs> so this rocket ship can go to the moon and back. Um, but definitely drive to that E sharp in the left hand at measure 35. And then the rest is all essentially dominant. You know, the fifth of the chord. This is in B minor. The fifth of B minor is F sharp. F sharp's the dominant, so. This is all dominant. This is all F sharp. Now, when the piece ends, in my score, this is a, a Henley edition. It's Urtex. We just got a single note. <laughs> uh, but don't end there. Gosh, no. A piece like this that's so fiery and colorful, spinning textures all over the place, uh, needs a big finish. So 
embellish that last chord in some way. Uh, this is totally appropriate. It's actually expected in Bach. It's not notated on the page. They just didn't do that. In the same regard that if you're playing some of the suites, uh, like an alamand from a partita or a courant or something, and you come to the repeats, you go back, you play it a second time, you change it up. You add some trills or some mordants or some rolled chords here and there, little decorations. That is customary. It was not written on the page, but it was expected back then that the player would do so. And, uh, I mean, we're not going to... I don't think you need to ornament <laughs> the rest of this piece. There's enough going on as it is. But that last note, instead, here's what I do. So, uh, first off, actually, let me play what, what's written. So, you can see how boring this, this last bar is. Okay, <laughs> that's the end. It's B minor. Uh, but roll it. Here's what I do. I love doing this. And when you come out of the chord, right before, so you go into it with a lot of energy deep into the chord, but then you also, right before you release the keys, you push on the keys, like from your arm, like you push as though your finger is going to come out the bottom, push a little more, <coughs> and then come out quite vigorously and it'll create almost like that harpsichord sound that that, <laughs> that like gasping <laughs> breathy kind of sound it's very exciting and the roll all i did there i just a roll down and then a roll up and and again with some some help from the body I think it's so exciting. Ah, and that also completes the 15 uh, sinfonias. That's the last one in the set. So you want to go out with a nice bang there. <laughs> and remembering it's in B minor. Bach didn't. Uh, <laughs> he wrote some of his biggest pieces in B minor, that's for sure. So this little piece is feeling quite proud to have been composed in that key.
And so that completes this tutorial. I'm going to be playing this piece uh, soon, soonish. So uh, I'll have that up when I can, and you can check that out and see if I'm doing all the things that I say you should be doing. <laughs> um, mostly having fun with it and communicating something through the sound. Uh, there's, there's lots more videos on my channel you can watch, and uh, if you choose to watch one now, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much for your comments, and, and as always for watching. Happy practicing, <laughs> stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>